an area of South African historiography that many people think uh, is, is over and done with, but, but I don't think so. And that is oral tradition proper. Uh, oral tradition being a subset of oral history, which deals with stories that are at least one uh, generation old. And I was fortunate to uh, come across uh, an oral tradition which has got two major, which is exceptional for two major reasons. The one is that it is certainly over 400 years old. And the second aspect is it was never copied down at any point or recorded at any time during the colonial era. So what comes down to us uh, in the 21st century is, is something that is uh, un, un, as far as possible unblemished or un, uncontaminated by direct colonial uh, interference. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's been collected twice, uh, but the two collections, the two traditions are again entirely independent of each other. Uh, it was first collected by Professor Harold Scheub of the University of Wisconsin in the 1960s, but he only published it in the mid 1990s uh, and was collected in the district of Tzolo. Um, myself, together with Dr. Kwandiwe Kondlo, collected the second version, uh, not being uh, from Chief Isaac Matiwane of, of Krumu. Tzolo and Krumbu are the two chiefdoms of the Ponomise people, and they don't normally interact. In fact, they've interacted uh, more recently than they ever had done uh, before. Now, this is a, a very lengthy oral tradition, which I've reproduced in full in the paper uh, to try and uh, put across some idea of the equality. Uh, but I'll just quickly break it down into the four essential sub-stories of which it's composed. The first sub-story deals with a Ponomise hunting in the mountain and they come across a small furry animal. But when they pick it up, they see it's not an animal at all. It's a Mtwakazi, that is a San female baby. And, and they bring it home to the king. The second story is the female baby grows up in the king's household where she seduces the king uh, by her skill, according to the uh, story, in cooking meals for him. And as a result, he disinherits his great son, his accepted great son, Dosini, and installs a Tricha, the son of the Twakazi, as the, uh, uh, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, third story, uh, Dossini uh, then disgraces himself in, in a very um, way that the way it was told to me, uh, he hides in the mud by the river and his friend throws mud at the herd boys not realizing that by so doing, they are throwing mud at the king apparent. Uh, this has been um, so sensationalized uh, lately by uh, the idea that he went down and he molested young women who were bathing in the river. But that's not the way the story was originally recorded, either by myself or by Professor Scheub. Uh, lastly, um, on account of this misdeed, uh, the king convenes a meeting at which Dossini is disinherited in favor of uh, Tricha, the son of um, Twakazi. Uh, but you cannot simply disinherit somebody. You have to torture the royalty out of that person, uh, which is um, uh, because the, the king also has other sons all of whom are legally married. Um, so why should this particular son, the son of the Mtwakazi, inherit? Because he is the only one who tortures Dossini to the extent that Dossini gives up the chiefship or the kingship. 
Now, now that story is not contested by either side in the dispute. On the one hand, you have the adherence of Dossini, the heir apparent who was disinherited by his father for his apparent misdeeds. On the other hand, you have uh, the Majola family, uh, the descendants of uh, Tricha and Trakazi, uh, who have been ruling uh, as far as all the other nations in the, the Eastern Cape are concerned for 400 years. But in spite of that, the Dorsinis have never given up their claim. So what I do, so, so that's the story. And the story could go off in, in different directions. You've actually got in part one, you've got the, 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 the one that I finished, which is the legal uh, progression, but it's also got implications in oral history more generally, in historiography more generally, which I've circulated as, as part two. But let me maybe finish with part one and then Chair, I'll give you a pause so we, we could maybe exhaust part one before we go on to part two. Now, uh, for literally hundreds of years, the Majola family rule over the Amampondomise. They, they seem to be quite uh, quarrelsome people. They are split, they are split after split. But when the colonial presence is established, the king of, or the, 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 the paramount chief of the great house, the Kumbu house, Mflantlo, uh, killed the magistrate, Hamilton Hope, in a, a, a picturative style scene. Uh, and after that, the magistrates, the colonial authorities take revenge on the line of the Majolas to an extent that ever since the 1880s, their kingship has never been recognized. Oh. I want dog wallpaper. Oh. So, sorry, so I didn't you, quite... Please mute yourself. Thank I, I didn't you. quite hear. It's fine. No, it was somebody, some interference. We're fine. Okay. Yeah, now... Uh, after about 250 years, or maybe let's uh, say in uh, 1905, Mshlontlo, the, 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 the royal who has personally killed the magistrate or given orders for him to be killed, is uh, brought to trial. He gives himself up. He wants to die at home. He's brought to trial, uh, and in the meantime, there's a Christian element uh, of one of whom is a man named Charlie Tonjani, the son of a policeman. Uh, and uh, in an interesting article published by William Baynard in the 1980s, he looks at this particular set of incidents, um, but he doesn't, he, William Baynard, does not actually zero in on the Dorsini angle. Because in order to justify his stature as against the descendants of Majola, Charlie Tonjani brings up this whole thing, but the magistrates uh, don't want to know. And that is what I call in the paper, the second coming of Dostini. Fast forward again, over 50 years, and the, the grandson of Tony John, um, Charlie Tonjani, uh, by the way, for those uh, people who are uh, knowledgeable about the early history of black nationalism, uh, Elliot Tonjani, who's quite famous in the political history of the 1930s, is actually part and parcel of the same family. But um, when democracy happens, and it's a long story, but it's in the paper, Vic Tonjani, an, a newspaper editor, as he edits a newspaper he paid for himself, puts himself forward and he revives the claim. But he's not actually the first person in line in the Dorsini family because he's the 
son of a, a brother. So when the democratic government sits in the 20, uh, 2006, they appoint a commission called the Nklapo Commission, which has now got to sort out who are the genuine kings and who are the appointed kings that were created by colonialism. They are not actually one contender for the restoration of the Ponomisa kingship. There are now three. There is the Majola line, the descendants of Mshlontlo and um, Twakazi, the sand lady. There is the direct line of Dosini, the one who was cooed by the son of Twakazi. And there is Tonjani, who has done more than anybody else to revive uh, the kingship and put forward the claim, and he now gets left behind. So in the paper, I trace all the argument back and forth. And what I emphasize is that all the participants in this, in this dispute are essentially telling the same story. Uh, they may emphasize those parts of it which uh, suit them and play down the parts of it that don't suit them, but they're all telling the same story. Uh, and this is what I find so important from the viewpoint of the historiography uh, of, of oral tradition. But what one found, and I was myself also a member of the Ntlapo Commission, is the Ntlapo Commission are not actually interested in the events uh, that actually took place or which allegedly took place. They are only interested in customary law, which is what is the law of succession? of the Ponomises. Is it customary, for example, that the son of the great wife should inherit, in which case Dossini is further ahead? Or is, uh, is it legitimate to uh, stab your rival with spears so that he, he gives up the kingship? This is obviously not part of customary law. Fortunately for the Majolas, however, that is the Mpwakazi faction, uh, the commission decides that there, there isn't a kingship after all, that the Ponomises are not entitled to any kingship because they were not kings, but in terms of the Framework Act of 2003 and so on, they are nothing more than senior traditional leaders. Now the whole thing goes to court, Majola and Dosini join together to say, uh, actually, we too, we, we don't agree with each other, but we do agree that the kingship which was taken away from us following the death of Hamilton Hope, the kingship should be restored. So after a long legal wrangle, again, it's in that paper, uh, the government uh, agrees to restore the kingship of the Ponomise. But now the question of who is the rightful heir comes back into the frame. If we follow customary law, then clearly the Dossini uh, are, 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 are the rightful kings because their mother was properly married to the king, and they maintain that everybody since Tosini was deposed is a usurper. Uh, and that, if in, in a strict reading of customary law, is the case. But the judge who finally decides, although the thing is still under appeal, comes down clearly and says, you cannot apply customary law that happened 400 years ago among black people long before the white, first white person set foot uh, in, in Table Bay. And, and I think there's a great importance legally uh, because it completely undoes the foundation, it explodes the foundation of the Framework Act according to which all traditional leaders are chosen, which says, if in doubt, employ the golden thread of uh, customary law.
So um, I've said a mouthful. Give me a break. Uh, it's over to you. Are you sure you don't want to uh, make any other tie up any other other threads? Since uh, the two papers are, after all, the two parts are very much connected. Is there anything else you want to do to tie them together? I think that would be helpful for us. Uh, okay. Let me then proceed to part two. I think so. So yeah. part one uh, gives the story of Dossini, and then it also gives the legal wrangle that follows, uh, up to the point that it seems as if the Majola faction are going, well, in fact, the president has already installed the candidate of the Majola faction as the king. Um, now, Following in part two, I'll make four points. Uh, the first is that the story of Dossini is not the same as the history of Dossini. There are outside of the story little bits and pieces that we can uh, add on or use to correct the story of Dossini because as Vancina has pointed out, uh, oral tradition is not history as it happened. Oral tradition is people's, contemporary people's understanding of what happened. It's not actually what happened. And as Professor Cohen pointed out, um, I don't know if this is the same Professor Cohen I can see on my screen. It is indeed. Uh, you have to uh, look beyond the story to other things which will enrich the, 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 the story. And in fact, again, not going into detail, you find that little, uh, if you dig into the traditional histories of all the neighboring kingdoms, whether it's the Krosas, whether it's the Tembus, whether it's the Pondos, you find little bits and pieces of the old Pondomise kingdom that have fled from what I call the Dossini Wars. So you can posit um, about 300 years ago, a, a great political explosion uh, that took place sending splinters flying in all directions that has never shown up in any, any colonial document but on which we depend entirely for, for uh, oral, uh, on, on oral uh, history. Uh, the second aspect is that as a unregenerated dinosaur of the Marxist era, uh, what about uh, what about the workers? Uh, what about the women? Uh, all of this is politics. What else is involved in this? And again, in the in the the paper, I do try and explore this. Uh, because it does seem that certainly there's an element in it of intergenerational conflict that Dossini had in Dossini, the heir apparent, uh, had in fact, in a way, rebelled uh, against uh, his father before, while his father was still alive. Uh, so there is this intergenerational aspect. And then the whole question of the, the misdemeanor of Dossini. If we hadn't collected the full tradition, but we've just gone to the hearings, you'd, you'd have found that Dossini uh, was actually molesting girls at the river. There's a mystical element as well, because the name of Dossini's friend who helps him in these misdeeds is uh, basically person with a face like the cat of a witch. So there, there's that other whole set of things. The, the third aspect I want to come up with in, in part two is what does this tell us about the historiography of oral tradition? Uh, this is my attempt to enter a global dialogue after sleeping for over 20 years. Um, in uh, Vancina revised his original book, Oral Tradition. His original book, Oral Tradition, which was written in about 1960, uh, seemed to assume that oral tradition uh, was in fact literally true. By the 1980s, Vancina had moved on and he had taken the point from Professor Scheub 
whose specialist was a specialization was the Cosa Fairy Tales, um, that the performance is all important. And um, the, the, the person who is relating the story makes an important input into the, the nature of the story, such that you've got to actually look at the person telling the story in order to, 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 to critique it. And my point is that this is actually not so. And in fact, anybody who compared a Cosa Ibali, which is a historical tale, with a Cosa Insomi, uh, which is a fairy tale, would, would, would only be laughed at and that Shoib's own attempts to, to, to analyze oral traditions in a book he, he, he wrote before he unfortunately passed away called The Tongue is Fire is a, is a miserable failure, but let that ride. Uh, the point I want to make is beyond, um, as an oral tradition is not actually literally true, cannot be literally true. You cannot simply look at the presentation because what we learn from this Dorsini case is that both sides, all sides of um, uh, agree on the tradition. It's not about the content of the tr tr tradition. And to understand how this happens, we actually have to look at the fact that a, a, a genuine or not genuine doesn't exist. An oral tradition is not something that is told by, uh, that just happens. It takes several generations for uh, an authentic oral tradition to emerge. And now my last and final point. Um, now, I try to apply this to the debate that is erupted between John Wright and Carolyn Hamilton on the one hand and Elizabeth Eldridge on the other hand about the, uh, uh, in their books on the rise of the Zulu kingdom. Basically, Elizabeth Eldridge says, the oral tradition says this and the oral tradition says that and uh, Hamilton and Wright have got it wrong because they're in conflict with oral tradition. What Wright says in his response is, no, 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 you've got to actually realize that every uh, uh, person who tells a story is going to tell it differently. You've got to examine the background of that person, the motivations of that person. And he goes as far as saying that the famous uh, oral testimonies uh, that are recorded in uh, the, the James Stewart archive are not oral traditions, but merely conversations. Whereas what I would say is what is recorded in the James Stewart archive is not, are not oral traditions, but they are oral testimonies. And that in the course of time, if there had not been for a colonial conquest, in the course of time uh, and, and over the generations, the differences between the different testimonies would have been ironed out. And therefore, you can't simply look, as Wright is saying, at the different informants one at a time. You've got to look at all the informants together. There are over 20 testimonies in the James Stewart archives on uh, how uh, the relationship between Shaka and his father and on Shaka's role in the uh, death of his mother. Now, again, when you find that over 20 of the informants are all saying the same thing, uh, and there are only a couple that are saying something else, although you cannot say that you know what oral tradition concerning Shaka would have emerged, you can more or less guess by the way things are going after a generation or two, what will ultimately come out. Okay, uh, the, 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 the praise poet normally says, Dini, which means uh, here I stand. So here I stand, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, very interesting indeed. And, you know, really these are questions that, um, you know, that they're in some ways old debates, but they're questions that our postgraduate students are having to confront.
like as every new generation of historians must do. And it's wonderful that, um, that you've been able to, to, to present this to us today. And indeed that uh, David William Cohen is able to join us from Michigan. All right, so the way this, this works is I will invite uh, you to raise your hand. There is a raise hand function should be in the bottom right of your, uh, your Zoom. Uh, and uh, you can also type messages in the uh, chat and if necessary, I can also read them out for you. But join, if you need to draw um, your, my attention, please just uh, do so in the chat. All right, who would like to get us going? If you click on reactions, by the way, you can find the raise hand function. I see a raise hand by Nafisa Isop Sheikh. All right, Nafisa. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much, um, especially Jeff. Uh, this is, as uh, as with all of your work, extremely engaging, um, and it's a great privilege to to be part of this conversation today. And um, I'm happy to see uh, so many uh, of my friends are also attending. Um, I, I'm glad that uh, your presentation uh, included both parts of the paper because I think that there are some sort of really sort of key connections between the four proposals you put forward in part two and uh, the way in which um, you sort of lay out the story in part one. And I think that we might want to, uh, sort of as the seminar goes on, have uh, hopefully fruitful discussions around what those connections might be. I have, um, I suppose it's, it's sort of one large question, but I think it, it also, it, it connects to, to one, one part of, uh, of uh, the oral evidence, but I'm just going to sort of ask the general question first. And that is that um, your fourth proposal in part two, uh, which is uh, to, um, to use the, the debate of El Eldridge Hamilton and Wright analogously, um, comes down on the side uh, in the end of the idea of um, sort of a central repetition of over generations of content constituting veracity. And um, I think that's kind of, as I understand it, the gist of the presentation, feel free to, to correct me. And the problem I have with this particular thing, which is why I'm, I'm most sympathetic perhaps to, to John Wright, um, and um, and I think I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm sure David Cohen will speak for himself, but I suspect that um, that this is perhaps um, uh, not quite how uh, the shards of history is is sort of um, you know I think mo imaginatively mobilized for use. Um, I, my question really is about what is the relationship really between hegemony and history. Um, and the reason I ask that is of all the professional historians, for example, attending the seminar, I'm pretty certain 100% of them have taught uh, the great Glossa cattle killing. Um, and I am almost certain that 100% of them have taught uh, the great Glossa cattle killing by Jeff Perez. Um, I would be very surprised, however, if um, more than 15% of them had uh, taught the 1996 uh, rereading by Helen Bradford in the Journal of African History of the ways in which uh, gender could really have changed very really uh, the ways in which evidence was read in the story. And so I suppose what I'm saying is that um, as narratives go, and if we are to say that that oral tradition and the stuff that historians um, uh, uh, produce you know, are, can be largely undifferentiated in some ways, then we have analogous makings of narratives. And the thing about that is, um, then what about the critique of power that's emerged over the last 30 to 40 years? Because the thing about the James Stewart archive is that um, it's almost, it's not hard to believe that people living in a contemporaneous society, I mean, at the same time, would give evidence um, with, certain kinds of central themes. So I, having actually read the 17 versions of uh, the story of Shaka and Nandi, um, 
I'm, you know, I'm still with John Wright, partly because I'm more or less certain that, uh, that James Stewart would have overwhelmingly interviewed men. Um, and so there is a particular ver way in which these stories would, would, would take shape, but also even if, you know, he managed to include a significant proportion of women, hegemony and sort of patriarchal hegemony works um, in a way, for example, that invests women inside of the story and their identities as mothers, as um, houses and as wives in different houses, um, with buy-in and investment in these stories as well. And I'm going to wrap up this sort of theoretical part of the question by actually coming back to what you you refer to as a sort of recent memory, including um, sort of claims of molestation in the Decini story. And because I think that that's really quite important because reading part one, I had no idea really what Dossini had done, what the brutality was until I got to page six and read the word rape. And it seemed to me, for example, that we were talking about cattle the whole way. But of course, I studied Kozul and Atal and I know that, you know, cattle and gender are intertwined endlessly. But I think it's very, very striking that um, you have said that the inconsistencies of different versions of the stories would have been ironed out over time when what we're actually getting in the present is different versions rather than kind of ironing out. If anything, time tends to produce more narratives rather than fewer as I understand it, but uh, you know, feel free to correct me and I will end there. Thank you very much. So I am looking for other hands, but I suspect while we wait, um and I have to see if some questions are now coming. Please do draw um, my attention to your name if you'd like to ask a question or raise your hand. Jeff, why don't you get going on answering that in the meantime? Uh, yes, no, 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 no. Thank you, Nafisa. Um, I think I did. I think I did understand you. And uh, Stephen, let me uh, immediately uh, request you to convene a seminar on Helen Bradford's paper uh, which reflects on my opinion of the cattle killing uh, because um, she, she has taught it uh, at uh, UCT uh, and I've never actually had a chance to respond but if one if Nafisa would like to know uh, my opinion now is not the time but in the second edition of my book uh, 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 Dead Will Arise the Indiana uh, University Press version, which is pirated and which from which I derive no benefit. No, I've never even, they never even send me a copy. Actually, that's my grudge. It uh, does not have uh, my response to Helen Bradford, but the Jonathan Ball edition has. And I'll be glad, Stephen, should there be the interest to come back on your show. Is that the right word? Uh, to discuss this, uh, but also to discuss at the same time, not only the perception of women in oral tradition, uh, but the fact that uh, the overwhelming opinion now among uh, Kosa speaking uh, people uh, is not that the cattle killing was engineered by Sir George Gray, but that the whole story is untrue and false and was engineered by uh, whites to make black people look bad. And that is the dominant narrative today. Uh, with with the, uh, respect to what Nafisa says, uh, Nafisa, I, I fully agree with you that it's very interesting that the story of Dossini's misdeeds, uh, the misdeed to, for, for those that haven't read the paper, is according to the original story. By the original story, I don't mean that this is necessarily the correct version. Uh, but both versions uh, give a very strange tale that Dossini and his friend hid on the banks of the river and covered themselves with mud so that they looked like monsters and they frightened the herd boys who threw stones away. Now, when the same story was told uh, in a contemporary setting in Tartus City uh, in front of literally hundreds of people, uh, not to mention the uh, commission and so on, uh, 
uh, both sides had changed the story to say that uh, Dossini was charged with molesting women. The Dossini say he never molested women, but that the girls had come to steal firewood from, uh, from his place. Uh, the Majolas, of course, went to town on the idea that uh, he had seriously molested women. Um, so I'm saying that the drift of hegemonic opinion is uh, in favor of that women were centrally involved in the misdemeanors of, uh, um, um, uh, of uh, Dossini. Uh, in, in terms of hegemonic ideology, I think the only thing I want to say right now is, uh, because I'm revising my book, The House of Paolo, by the way, you must all buy it, but don't hold your breath, um, it, 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 it is that there's no question that this was a patriarchal society. It was a very severe patriarchal society uh, in which women could not even pronounce the name of the ruling monarch. Uh, if his name was, for example, Langa, which means sun, when they actually looked at the sun in the sky, uh, they, they had to use a synonym because they dare not. So the, the patriarchalism of the pre-colonial society is not something that is open to question. It's how you interpret it and how you situate it in a historical context that is open to question. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I think we may well take you up on your offer. Um, I, it's certainly in our department, I know I, I've, I've certainly taught and others too, um, your work and Helen's work on this side by side. And uh, actually it would be wonderful. Zoom, Zoom does allow us to do this kind of thing. So, so we'll keep talking about that. I have two more hands coming, uh, Karen and then David. Let's start with Karen. Uh, hello. I have more of an observation than necessarily a question, but one of the things that stood out to me as I was reading the article was in the narrative that is told by Chief Isaac Matiwane, that the ways in which um, the Twakazi is, uh, is re uh, detailed or referred to uh, revealed to me quite a lot about the conflicts of the story as it's come down over the centuries. So for example, on the one hand, uh, she's spoken about as being a child of the great house and she's revered to such an extent that other women learn her language rather than her being expected to learn th their language. Um, and then uh, at other times she's referred to as a little girl, uh, which I think is showing her innocence in the matter and therefore perhaps the innocence of her son. And then finally, how she's described towards the end of the narrative as a wild animal, although that's also at the beginning of the narrative, but described as a wild animal, which shows her as this outsider, which is in stark contrast to her being a child of the great house, which then again reinforces this idea of her son being an outsider. So I just thought that in terms of women, maybe we don't necessarily have women, we don't hear their voice, but in looking at the way that um, she is described or the words used about her, we are getting quite a bit of information. That's all I wanted to say. No, thank you. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very interesting point. Uh, when, when you look at the, the first component of the tradition, which is the, the, the story of Ntwakazi, um, the, the way I interpreted it is that the, the tellers of the story um, go out of their way to emphasize the, 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 uh, the way in which she was captured and brought home from a, a hunt because uh, as people from the Rock Art Institute will also tell you, the um, Amamponomise are renowned among Kosa speaking people as being those who are most close to the Abatwa. And uh, the, the question obviously arises, in fact, I think in some of the work on Rock Art, uh, 
it, 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 it's even been suggested that because the royal house of the Ponomises are actually have got Twa, that is the son, uh, blood in them, it, it affects their, 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 their relationship. Uh, I have to say that the, uh, uh, during the, uh, the actual hearings where people from both sides were, were verbalizing, um, Twakazi, which does not imply uh, a, a small uh, lady, but a, or, or, or a young lady, it simply shows that it's a female as opposed to a, um, a male. They used um, very contemptuous language when referring to uh, the, the, this uh, young girl uh, as if you're not talking about uh, a real person. And therefore, how can you actually um, throw out uh, the son of the great house in favor of the son of, uh, well, as you quoted, um, a wild animal. But I should also just mention that the, the marriages in these uh, great families were um, uh, complots between male families. Uh, the, the girl very likely or, or very rarely had, had any say, and particularly in terms of dy dynastic uh, marriages. One could also see this as a woman, a young woman on her own, challenging the entire hegemony of, uh, ma uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the two great families, the the great wife being the daughter of the chief of the Amakwati, who were a very powerful group related to the Klesibe. But let me not ramble on us. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Jeff. I have two questions lined up. I have David and then Bukhotlo, but I'm also looking for other hands or, or messages in the chat. David? Um, I, uh, Jeff Perez, uh, this is just a fascinating paper and a kind of good it wakes up a, a lot of discussions and debates, and I think sets things up for a much, a very possibly productive discussion in the uh, in the future. And um, I, it, uh, there are a lot of things I'd like to to pull out of this and discuss, but. Um, I'll just take uh, one, or, one or two things. One, that's my dog who wants to participate in the discussion. Um, is uh, that uh, it seems like the first Vancina, the one who we had problems with, was the one who thought there was a archetype early oral tradition that then uh, become falls apart or changes over time till we have a breakdown and we have examples of different ones. And then there's the later Vencina, which um, uh, where the there's a settling up and a production of a, a recent or contemporary uh, oral tradition that we now have to distinguish from what really happened or what history can tell, say what happened. And I don't, it seems to me like this is a trap a little bit because uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that, I mean, in spite of the richness of your text, in spite of the richness of your discussion, uh, it doesn't seem to me that we can presume that this, uh, account or these accounts have really settled uh, into something that is now uh, more stable than it ever was. And, uh, you know, I kind of think of a more of a pulsating model where at different times in the past, uh, people were called to pull together their thoughts about um, something or their knowledge and, and they pull them together uh, often in, in stories that are well well told. So um, uh, I, I, that's one intriguing thing. And then I, 
I'd really like to to see if if you could play with the comparison of of the judge and the historian on the question of what um, the value of a model of oral tradition is, because what is it doing for us? What is a Vencina model or a, some alternative model actually doing for us in uh, doing research on uh, early African history? Um. No, no, thank you. Thank you, uh, David. I think uh, many of us started at Wisconsin and then we all headed off in, in different directions. I, I got a lot out of your, your paper in Joe Miller's book. But let, let, me, um, let me say that I, I had the benefit, I'm not sure that I made the most of it, of sitting through many days of the two sides and then also the contribution of uh, Mr. Tonjeni. Uh, of, of people uh, talking about these things. And obviously it is a very unusual um, a performance, uh, locale for a performance uh, to be, uh, you know, sitting in the uh, Mtata City Hall uh, in front of a whole bunch of people from Pretoria, uh, as it were making your bid uh, for the kingship of the nation, which had been lost for 150 years. You can imagine that uh, people got quite excited and the Dorsinis, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to put them in a bad light, but they did get President Zuma down uh, to uh, declare their candidate the, the, the correct person. So there was, a, there was a lot of interest in this. Um, so I'm not for... And, 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 and what I certainly cannot answer, and I doubt anybody can answer, is how the story would have fluctuated over the course of time, whether it would have been the same story in, let's say, 1900, uh, as the story I heard 100 years later, but that the broad contours of the story are agreed by both parties. Uh, and that the, it, it's the interpretation of the, of the components. I try to give something of the, 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 the flavor. Uh, on a, a theoretical level, uh, let me simply say that I went, uh, I, I went walkabout in 1988 when I left Rhodes University and I never really returned. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, any input and guidance. I just, uh, through the wonder of Google Scholar, I did my best in a short time, but I don't actually know what's going on at a theoretical level. Uh, let me leave it there. How about that? Uh, yeah. You can leave it at unsettlement. Um, David, do you want to come back or shall we take the move to the next questions? I, I, I think the court proceeding is really fantastic to, that this judge is, uh, I hope he's a member of the South African Historical Association. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I think that there's just a real opening here. I think uh, Jeff has done a great job in, in kind of opening these questions back up and uh, giving us some, something really meaty to work on. But um, there, there is a paper, a long ago paper that I fell in love with by Ben Blount called Agreeing to Agree on Luo Tradition. is a, a kind of sociological look at how people come to agree against difference. Um, they come to agree on uh, a tradition or a story. And um, I think that, that there is that the, if there, um, the observation that the parties in this case came to agree on certain things, uh, I think that that has to be taken apart and studied more closely. I think one has to look at that agreeing as kind of a process of um, kind of a sociology or an economy. Um, so uh, economy of, of making their case, making it more efficient um, and um, 
uh, of imagining what the court will want to hear or which other powers will want to hear, you know, which is not necessarily what they will hear, but it's an idea of what they want to hear. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there and let Jeff go on. Do you want to come no, back, Jeff? No, 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 no. Sorry, Chair. Um, I trust we'll find some way to take this further out of Absolutely. the framework of the Zoom seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Dave. So I have uh, Bukhotlo and Natasha, and I might also have another one in the chat from Prudence. Uh, let's do Bukhotlo and Natasha together first. Bukhotlo? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I really, I enjoyed reading this paper and I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Um, Sam mentioned that Dossini molested children in the river. However, that is not recorded in the paper. I want to know why. And again, I want to ask why Rika, I can't pronounce it, Rika, uh, the son of Mtokazi, they've been emphasized that his mother was not married, but the ill behavior of Dosini was, was not recorded. I think, I don't want to say it's kind of biased, but I think this shows that this paper is more in favor of those of the real blood, despite what they do. So I want to know why the ill behavior of Dosini is not recorded, but because the thing that Mtokazi was not married is being emphasized, emphasized over and over, despite her taking care of their chief, which is King Iqua or something. Yes. And before, before you tackle that, Jeff, uh, Natasha? <clears throat> Thanks everyone and hi Jeff, it's been a long time. Um, I was I had a couple of, of questions um, more generally um, and I've been thinking about a conversation I've been having with Liz Gunner recently about um, various of the um, uh, Izibongo that she collected in KwaZulu-Natal in the 1980s, especially the women's tales, the ones that don't get reported and handed down um, from person to person. So in a nutshell, for um, some of you there, uh, part of Liz's argument is that uh, what women record are, are domestic affairs, what we might understand it as affairs of the heart and the home uh, and the family, um, and that it's the trials of, of chieftainship um, that uh, men record. And I, I know I'm playing very loosely with genre here. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the statement that uh, what we have is a sort of set of two traditions recorded in the 19th century. Um, oh, sorry, not recorded in the 19th century, recorded in the 20th century, but that weren't recorded during the period of um, European colonization in the Eastern Cape. Um, because it's entirely possible uh, that stuff was recorded, uh, but yet not, um, but because of who it was recorded by, it wasn't handed down. Um, and I'm, I, I'd, I'd like to encourage you to speculate on why we don't know more about this particular tradition, if we refer to it as a tradition. And then I'm also just, um, it's curious, I've been doing, um, uh, uh, myself and, and the second year African history students gave up trying to read um, Pass Through the Rainforest um, recently because we decided that um, Hansina was just far too impenetrable. Um, but much like Pass of the Rainforest, I suppose. Um, what makes me curious is that most of the current discussion about this broader set of genres, and I'm actually going to call them forms or uh, uh, textual forms, taking the um, point from Karen Barber is in fact that these things can't be considered outside of the context of their 
performance. So uh, in terms of audience, so it's not the performance itself. Um, you were speaking about that earlier, but rather the nature, the way in which audiences um, confirm and then uh, uh, deny or, or participate in the um, authentication, and I use that word in scare quotes, um, of particular oral traditions. And I'm thinking particularly here of the role of the customary courts, because I've been working recently on the idea of customary courts in the Eastern Cape as being um, performances of um, meaning, um, particularly in relation to cases of seduction. Um, so how do you see the proceedings in the um, 1996 hearings as, and the more recent hearings as well, as contributing to the establishment um, of the traditions? I mean, I, I do wonder, uh, uh, David was just talking about the judge and the historian, I do wonder to what extent, um, in fact, um, the, the describing of the claims before the court, some as historical claims and some as cu customary claims, you know, are in fact um, just a way of glossing over some two issues that are in fact very similar. Thanks very much. Um, I, 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 people have said interesting things and I might not be able to, to, to address them. Uh, but, but clearly the question of the woman's voice is, is paramount in, in both contributions. Uh, and uh, I think I must begin by re reiterating um, that this, I mean, I'm talking about pre-colonial era and it was a very, very patriarchal society in which the, I, I can say the exile of women from the political and judicial space uh, not only were they excluded from courts of law or discussion of politics and so on, but they were not even able to, to mention uh, any word in which the husband's name uh, contributed a syllable. And to, to just give a personal anecdote, um, in, in, I started my field work in 1975 uh, and at that point, um, I spoke no Corsa and I understood very little. And I had to work through a, um, an interpreter. Uh, but I, I, I had a sort of a little bit of an understanding. Uh, and I was introduced to this um, a particular old, old uh, uh, female in person. Um, who had actually lived at the court of King Sahili, who died in uh, 1893. Uh, and with my imperfect cross, I, I was listening for a proper name, because much as I couldn't understand what was being said, I could recognize the proper names of the senior officials at the court. Uh, and, and, I, and eventually, I, I just got very frustrated and I said through the interpreter to the, 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 the old, old person, but why do you not mention the name of, king, of, of the king? She says, I have mentioned it, but because it was in the Shronipa language, um, I'm, I'm, I didn't pick it up. And, and I'm not now going to make excuses that there was probably in my first book, a lot of things I didn't pick up, although I still won't agree with Helen Bradford, but that's another issue. Um, I think the, uh, what, 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 what is very clear though is that things are changing and they are changing quite rapidly and that hopefully, um, uh, um, I'd like to refer you to, I think it's uh, the, 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 the first part of, uh, the first section of part, of, of part two, um, where, where I was talking about how the story of Dorsini should not be confused with the history of Dorsini. Now, uh, the Dorsini claimant had died during the course of these hearings, and he had been replaced by his sister. And his sister testified for the first time at the very last of the court uh, appearances, where she went out and actually did those things. Uh, which a historian is supposed to do. Uh, 
to go and look for information outside the, the framework of the story. So maybe I'm not the person who will ever be able to do it, but hopefully it, it is something that, 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 that will be done. Uh, the, the, the question of the, 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 the river, it is again, I think this was touched on, on uh, before, it was only actually while I was uh, preparing for the seminar that it struck me that the actual stories which I was told by very, very old males, or, or the two stories, the base stories, they don't mention women. They say that Dossini was persecuting herd boys. But in all of the uh, testimony, uh, they, they don't say herd boys, they say girls. Now, whether that means that the old guys were embarrassed to tell the truth in front of white males and they'd softened it down, uh, I really don't know. Um, however, in, um, in, in Chief Isaac's version, which is the one you've got in, in, my, in my paper, uh, he makes the link between Dorsini's behavior and Dorsini's uh, wish to build up a herd of cattle of his own independently uh, of his father, which I take to be, to be significant. Uh, by the way, um, I did sit right through all the hearings. And although the hearings were in Kosa, I took notes in English because it was easier for me. Uh, so I do have, uh, so as were on the spot translations uh, of what was said by the different people at different times through the course of the, the hearings and for substantial financial reward, I might be encouraged to actually type it up. Thank you. All right. um, Prudence has a question. Prudence, do you want to ask it or do you prefer me to read it out? Prudence. Okay, let me, I, I can quickly just gloss Prudence. Prudence's question is really for an a, sort of aspiring historians. How do you find, how, to, how do you analyze generational conflict um, within oral traditions? That's, that's her question. If, and if I can just sort of add, it, add a, my own question here. Um, what are the stakes, or maybe you could speak to this. Um, what are the stakes of the claim to, to kingship? Um, especially in the perhaps in the later part of years and the and the post apartheid years. So I mean, one understands perhaps there's there's simple recovery, um, ethnic competition and pride, but also I think we now know that that, that political economy does play a role because um, the, as Gavin Capp's work shows, this notion of a kind of tribal title is 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 one of the very paradoxical inheritances that we have from the past. And uh, chiefs in some instances are able to sign contracts with mining companies. So uh, I suppose I'm, I'm asking if that is anything that you're seeing at, at, in this story. And I'm looking for any final questions while you answer. Um, I, th I, think, I think you might have to start all over again. Uh, um, uh, let me try and take the second one first. This has got nothing to do with the story of Dorsini. Uh, obviously, there's a big difference between the Northwest Province and the Eastern Cape in terms of the uh, rewards of land ownership and the wealth uh, beneath the, the, the soil. Uh, what, um, and, 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 and I can say uh, uh, that once a person, any person, gets the idea that he or indeed she was born a traditional leader. Their spirits start to bother them. They, uh, I mean, it's something that is so deeply felt emotionally that to even try to describe what motivates people. I mean, I've known people, who the, uh, there was a, a, a person who was the Chief Magistrate of Butterworth, which is the second biggest town in the former Transkei, uh, who threw up his job. He did everything, gave up everything 
that when he, he died, his clothes were hanging on him because he believed he was born to be a, a senior traditional leader. I don't think it's something that can be reduced to ethnicity. It's, it's something that happens inside individuals who feel that they've been called. But where these things play out in political terms these days, I can give the example of the uh, Eastern Pondo land. Um, in Eastern Pondo land is where they're supposed to be building a, 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 what's called the Wild Coast Toll Road. And um, the, it's not that the, uh, the one faction doesn't want any toll road for any reason. The other faction, the less popular one, has attached itself to the government uh, and is using its support to, of the toll road to boost its, its claims, as it were. So, uh, so it does enter into the, in, um, um, into the, the, uh, 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 the political mix, uh, certainly, but not, not in a kind of um, a, a vulgar materialist way. Uh, as I said, there, there's, there's a lot of factors, um, and, and, and it's, 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 not, it's not necessarily got something to do with ethnic competition. Uh, I think the situation in KwaZulu-Natal is very different to the Eastern Cape in as much as uh, many ethnicities, I'm thinking specifically of the, the Amashlubi, uh, resent being placed under a Zulu king where they never ever were. But in the Eastern Cape, it's not so much, in, in fact, I've not seen competition within, uh, between ethnicities. It's, it's for seniority within, within the ethnic group that you were born into. I, I, I think I might have missed a question somewhere. Um, Prudence just asked about how, how you find inter intergenerational conflict in uh, oral tradition. Um, again, I think that one must, uh, to try and reply, um, in oral tradition proper, which is uh, defined, or I think is defined by things that happened more than a generation ago, uh, one of the points I try to make in the paper, but which... Um, uh, hasn't come up in the discussion so far, is that it's a struggle, oral tradition is a struggle of memory against forgetting. There are so many things that happen in the past and, and they get forgotten. Uh, if you take the, uh, the, 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 the pivotal moment uh, at which uh, King Schlontlaw orders the murder of the magistrate Hamilton Hope, I've not heard a single oral tradition about that. Everybody knows what's written in the books. There are other things that happened, the Fekane Wars, uh, which are not remembered, although they obviously had a dramatic effect. Um, so it, it, it's really a struggle. That's why the, the, the issue of mnemonics comes into it. The story's got to be a good and a memorable story. That's why the story of the War of the Axe is remembered, because there's a story about an axe. That's something that people can, can, can hang on to. But to Prudence, what I would say is you would look for, for cliches. You wouldn't look for actual case studies, but what you would look, you'd look for something like that story about the, um, the, 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 the there's a story about uh, an ox race among the Amampondo, I couldn't quote it exactly. But, but, but they are very few and far between, and they would normally, would normally see them in terms of uh, cliches. Let me also put in a plug here for something that I tried to mention here, and, and also in my previous paper on the legal thing. It is very, very important that someone should take up the early history of Juan de Bele, uh, the struggle between the Manala and the Zunza factions. The, uh, the story there is an even older story than, uh, than, than, than the one of Dorsini. And there are old texts. Uh, one of them I know of is actually in, not in Afrikaans, but in Dutch. Uh, and uh, there's been a huge miscarriage of justice there. Um, so, so I would like somebody to look at that, which I'm not going to, thank you. Thank you. So this will be our last round. I have a question from Linda Chisholm. Uh, Linda? Uh, 
Okay, please forgive me, Jeff, if you've dealt with this extensively in your paper, because I haven't actually read the paper. But I really am fascinated to know if you have read um, Zaik Dar's Little Sons, uh, what you think of his treatment of the Majora story and how this enters into the whole picture, the writing of it in, about it in novelistic form and so on. Thanks. Um, Linda, uh, hello Linda, we haven't met for a long time. Um, I did know Zaik Dar was, was writing the story. Uh, everybody in Solo and Kumbu knew that Zaik Dar was writing the story uh, because he's a Majola himself. Uh, everybody was looking forward to sharing with Zaik's um, uh, their own version but uh, none of us ever met him. We know he shuttles between Ohio and Stellenbosch uh, and, and, and I believe Herschel. Uh, the story, yeah, yeah, the story itself is good. Uh, I, I don't have any quarrels with anything that's in it, but uh, and I, I, I just don't know whether he consulted uh, uh, anybody uh, at home. Uh, he, uh, his descent is, after the after Hope's War, um, the, the the followers of of Mshlonklo, the 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 Ponomise king, fled to Lesotho, uh, where Zaix was brought up just on the other side of the border, in in, in Sturkspray. Um, so we, we feel that uh, it's, it's just he hasn't interacted with us, but so we not me. Uh, I'm, uh, he's a novelist. I think that came out in some other contexts I can think of. Then I, I, I think his version of history is pretty good. And I think he has had traditional input, but from Majo, excuse me, from Majolas up in Herschel, where as far as I know, there aren't any Docines. All right, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Jeff, this has been fascinating and I'm, I'm sure that uh, people will have other thoughts and questions and I think we may very well take you up on your very generous offer to to come back again if not in this seminar series then 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 perhaps in a in a separate workshop with our postgrads that'll be excellent so thank you very much uh, for for presenting today and thank you and thanks thanks to everybody for the time and patience thank you thank you everybody take care stay safe <laughs>